is a president of the United States visiting China. And you can see he's got a guard of honour. They've laid out the red carpet right up the steps to the plane. And you've got uh, the Chinese leaders there at the bottom of the steps ready to welcome the president. And so the more important a person is, the bigger the welcome that they get. Here's uh, a picture of William and Kate with Prince George. Now, when a royal baby is born in England, it's a very special occasion. Uh, and so uh, when a royal baby is welcomed into um, the world, there's an official announcement that is put on a golden easel outside Buckingham Palace. There it is. And uh, so it's announced to the world that the baby has been bought, brought into the world. And then there's a, a 41-gun salute by the King's Troop, uh, a Royal Horse Artillery, and the bells of uh, Westminster Abbey ring out in celebration of the birth. Because it's important. It means that a new um, potential heir to the throne has been born, a future King of England and perhaps of Australia too. Who knows? And royal babies always used to be built, born in Buckingham Palace itself, but now they uh, are born in St Mary's Hospital because uh, that's where they'll get the best care that they can possibly get. But of course, Jesus is a much greater king than any queen or king of England. How was he welcomed? And that's what we're going to look at, the welcome that he got. So we're going to start with a reading um, from Luke chapter 2. Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 to 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and pla placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. 
the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So at first, Jesus' birth is announced by an angel, an angel who comes to the shepherds. And the way he appears is significant. It says that the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terrified. Uh, the magnitude of the event is emphasised by the glory of God which surrounds this angel. Uh, what he's about to announce is from God himself and the shepherds need to know that. And so the angel says, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Really, when you think of it, the birth of a baby is a fairly ordinary event. Thousands of babies are born every day. Um, and, uh, of course, it's special when it's someone in our own family. Uh, we think this is a very special event, but actually there's lots of babies born all the time. But the significance of this baby is something very different and so announced by the angel and uh, we need to listen to what the angel says because that is critical also. The ex angel explains what the event means. This baby is to be a saviour, a rescuer. He will rescue us from the consequences of our sin so that through him forgiveness will be given and will be brought back into God's family again. But it also says he is Messiah or Christ, in other words, the promised king that people have been waiting for. He's come to reign on God's kingdom. That's also shown by the fact that he's born in the city of David, in Bethlehem, where King David came from, and the prophecies are that another king will reign on David's throne. Then we have a whole choir of angels singing God's praise. Uh, this, this whole thing is a mighty act of God. God reaching out to restore that broken relationship between people and himself. And as it says, to bring peace on those on whom God's favour rests. So the, the shepherds, they get the message and they rush off to see the, the newborn king. Uh, they're really excited about Jesus' birth. Uh, they get the significance. I think one of the important things about the shepherds is that they are ordinary people. They are humble people like us, perhaps. And Luke is emphasising uh, that God comes for humble people. In Mary's song, when, when the angel tells Mary she's going to have a baby and she goes to visit Elizabeth, uh, she sings the song. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Saviour. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts and brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. So Luke emphasises that Jesus comes from the humble and he comes very humbly himself to be born in a manger. So the shepherds recognise that Jesus is the saviour. He is the one that God has sent. And uh, they return glorifying and praising God for all the things that they have seen and heard. They, they are filled with joy, as the angel has said. They are excited about this event. And we come to our second reading from Luke. The second reading is taken from Luke, chapter 2, 22 to 38. Jesus presented in the temple. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. 
as it is written in the, law, in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for a revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. That was 38. Oh, sorry, I can't read. <laughs> We're up to uh, 33. The child's father and mother marvelled as to what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the failing and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be re revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped day and night, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. Well, here's two more people that um, we often don't hear about at Christmas. But uh, they probably saw Jesus before the uh, wise men. Um, the Feast of Purification, or the, the, the Ceremony of Purification, was to be 40 days after the birth of a child. And, uh, and then you remember, once the wise men had seen Jesus, uh, Mary and Joseph were warned to take him to Egypt and they, they fled so that uh, they can't have gone up to uh, the temple then. So it probably is before the wise men come. Anyway, it's part of the welcome that Jesus has as Jesus is presented before these two people. It says, Simeon, who was righteous and devout, he was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the spirit of the Lord was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. So he's waiting for the comfort of Israel, the consolation of Israel. What is that? Well, we have seen in Isaiah, we've seen in chapter 40, where it talks about God saying, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. And in Isaiah 57, it says, God speaking to the people, I was enraged by their sinful greed. I punished them and hid my face in anger, yet they kept on in their willful ways. I've seen their ways, but I will heal them. I will guide and restore comfort to Israel's mourners, creating praise on their lips. Peace, peace to those who are far and near, says the Lord. So in Jesus, this comfort, this salvation has come from God to God's people. Uh, the broken relationship, again, is restored between God and his people. There is peace with God, as the angel has also said. And Simeon goes on, My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles 
and the glory of your people Israel. So salvation for Israel, but also a light for the nations, for the Gentiles. And again, it just reflects the fulfilment of what Isaiah has been talking about. Chapter 49 there says, It's too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I've kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So Jesus here, he's welcomed as the fulfilment of, of the great vision of Isaiah, of the prophecies of all of the Old Testament. All of the Old Testament points forward to him and his salvation both for the people of Israel but for all nations. So Luke, Luke is emphasising that God's salvation is for everyone. And he does it another way. Um, he shows how... Various people are caught up in this salvation. There is young Mary, herself is probably a teenager. Uh, there are the very ordinary shepherds. And then here is an elderly man and an elderly woman. And so you've got men and women, old and young, Jew and Gentile. Um, Jesus comes to rescue and to save and to draw into God's kingdom all those different sorts of people. And, uh, and these passages are sort of bringing all that together and emphasising it when we look at the details. And now we come to hear of the wise men and Herod. The reading is from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 15. And that's on page 966 in the Pew Bible. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream, not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son.
And so we come to the wise men, or the magi, as they are called. Um, wise men is just sort of a way we translate it, but that's the word in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, they're not kings, even though our picture up there shows them with crowns on. Um, but they're probably royal advisors, people who studied the stars and uh, um, worked out the portents in the stars so they could advise the king on what he should do. But they see this particular star and they are led. They come from, it says, the east, so probably Babylon, Persia, somewhere like that, so possibly a thousand kilometres away. They've come a, a long way to uh, see the baby Jesus. But this is a passage from Matthew's Gospel, of course. Um, Luke chooses some events. Matthew chooses this one. Um, because these people are Gentiles. That's the emphasis that Matthew wants to make, that, that it's all nations, Gentiles too, coming to Jesus. And you know, right near the end of Matthew's Gospel, the command is given, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. So that... Uh, Matthew wants to make it clear that Jesus came to be saviour of people from all nations. As we saw last week, the Jews perhaps thought that only Jews could be God's people, but Matthew wants to show, no, it's, it's all people that Jesus came for, people from all nations. And so he's born in Bethlehem um, to fulfil the prophecy from Micah and uh, Herod has to consult with the teachers to find out the fact that he'd be born in Bethlehem. So he's king of the Jews, but king of all people. And the wise men come and they worship him. They offer gifts, which Matthew calls treasures, something to honour a king with. But in contrast to these Gentiles, the king of the Jews, Herod himself, um, wants to get rid of this baby. He can't stand the idea that there might be another king, that there might be someone that he should submit to. And so uh, Jesus' parents have to take him and flee down to Egypt. So we have the welcome from the wise men, the, the Gentiles, but some of God's people, the king of the Jews himself, doesn't welcome Jesus. So what sort of welcome does Jesus get? Well, it's very different from a royal welcome in England, isn't it? There's no golden notice out in front of the stable. Uh, there's no guns, no bells, no red carpet, nothing like that. It's a very humble birth in a manger, uh, not in a royal palace or even a very special hospital, but a very great welcome in many other ways. Choirs of angels who sing his praise, shepherds who rush to see him, people who have been waiting for him uh, for a long time, um, welcome him as he comes into the temple. Wise men who represent the people from other nations, they travel great distances to come and welcome him. They all gladly welcome him. They, they know that he is the king of kings in God's world. Uh, they know that he has come to make us God's people, to, to restore that broken relationship between us and God, that he is the saviour. And so they joyfully join in praising God for what he has done, that it is something that God is doing. But as I say, Herod represents the people who don't welcome Jesus and he reminds us that there are many who don't welcome him. And so we need to think about our own welcome. How do we welcome him? Uh, and it's not just singing carols. It's, it's really treating him as king. He comes as king, and that's emphasised throughout the scriptures. Um, we need to serve him and trust him as saviour, confident that he does restore our broken relationship with God, that uh, we do have peace with God, something that was broken by our sin. And, of course, all of those things are things we don't just do at Christmas. It's something we need to rejoice in and really trust in throughout the year as we seek to joyfully sing, serve him as our king. And so, because our relationship with God is restored, we can come before him in prayer. So let's do that. 
Lord Jesus, we welcome you as King, the Messiah, the one promised to be the Saviour of God's people. We join with the angels, shepherds, Simeon and Anna, the wise men, in rejoicing at your birth. Father, we thank you for all of those who attended our carol service last week, and we pray for our services on Christmas Day tomorrow. We ask that we and all who attend will take to heart the great message of Christmas. May we appreciate more fully our need of salvation and then find the assurance that that need has been fully satisfied in the life, death and resurrection of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord God, we pray for the nations of the world that you would lead them to seek for peace. As Mary sang in her song, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away empty. Thank you that you are a God of justice who cares for the downtrodden. We ask for a just end to the conflicts in Ukraine Palestine and other parts of this world. Be with those who seek to mediate between the warring factions. Father, we pray for those in our country who struggle to buy presents for their children or even to put food on the table. We pray for Anglicare and other organisations who seek to help those in need. We ask that our government may have wisdom in assessing where welfare payments are needed. We also pray for those who have been affected by flooding in North Queensland and fires in Western Australia. We pray for the recovery efforts in these communities, that uh, these communities may be supported and able to rebuild quickly. We thank you for the rain that has fallen to reduce the risk of bushfires and restore dry paddocks. We pray for those who are serving in other places, we think of Matt and Leonie Morrison in Broome, and particularly during the difficulties of the wet season. We pray for Leonie as she awaits the birth of her baby, that you would keep her and the rest of the family well. Bless their Christmas services in that town and their ongoing ministry to preschoolers, children, youth and adults. And we do ask that you would raise up more helpers to lead in the many children who are attending their church. And we pray for those who are sick in body or mind, for families where there is conflict or other troubles. We pray for Ernest Algama and Liza Hazelton. We pray for Gordon Bolton, um, who are currently in hospital. We pray for Sylvia in this time of anxiety. And we ask that you'll give to each of them your peace and your healing. We pray this in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen.